come in here thankful for freedom. Through the blood of the Lamb, there is no bondage.
Aren't you thankful that the guilt is gone? The shame was washed away. Every chain is broken. Speak that over your life. Lift your hands and sing it with us. Every every chain is broken. Every chain is broken. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for your freedom. Every chain is broken. Every chain is broken. Somebody lift your voice to the Lord. Somebody magnify the Lord. He's preached a great message this morning. He's coming back tonight. I don't know what he's got on mind or heart, what God has put there, but uh, whatever he's got to say, I'm sure will be edifying and strengthening and challenging to every single one of us. Again, we're glad you're here. Brother Marcus Baptiste, come preach to us the word of the Lord. Amen. Don't you love your pastor? Amen. Amen. I was just ready for him to continue. I was going to try to jump on that organ over there, figure something out. Amen. 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 I uh, love, love the fact that he's always challenging me uh, just to uh, dive deeper into the word. Uh, he genuinely loves the word. He genuinely loves the word. So has challenged me. Uh, to uh, find a greater depth and love for the Word of God. Amen. I'm so thankful that you're here. Amen. I'm so thankful that you're here. Such a privilege to be here tonight. Um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of an odd deal. I don't know why I feel like a disconnect. Is that just me? I don't know. I feel, feel a lot of tired people. I don't know if you guys are just weary. 
uh, I just kind of feel some. Of you, I feel a lot of frustration too. <laughs> some of y'all were fighting before y'all got here. Um. <laughs> amen, amen. So hopefully the Lord will help us before we leave. Uh, I do believe I have a word from the Lord, uh, and so we're going to jump right into that. If we can stand, First Samuel, chapter ten. First Samuel chapter 10. Look at the person next to you. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord. First Samuel chapter 10. First Samuel chapter 10. Uh, I've, I've actually read from this passage of scripture before, uh, but I'm going to use it to jump into a different subject. This morning I preached uh, Kingdom First, uh, and uh, if you allow me to, just for the next few minutes, I want to preach Kingdom Culture, sorry, Kingdom Structure. Kingdom Structure, if there needed to be a subtitle, it would just be called The Missing Link. Uh, we're going to start with verse 17. If you're there, say amen. If you're there, say amen. Oh, man, did you guys eat in between services? Yeah, I missed the nap? <laughs> amen, I'm telling you. <laughs> Amen. You don't want to miss your Sunday nap. That'll get you in trouble. First uh, Samuel chapter 10. Let's start with verse 17. Then it says, Then Samuel called the people together in the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel. I want you to watch this. So he says to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up, out, I brought you up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all the kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your uh, adver adversaries and your tribulations. This is Jesus speaking. Sorry, this is God speaking in the Old Testament uh, through the prophet Samuel. Uh, and Samuel's getting ready to anoint Saul as king. Samuel's getting ready to anoint Saul as king. So uh, I want us just to move down just a little bit further down. Uh, this is when God is explaining to the children of Israel uh, just kind of what's gone on in the past few years, the rejection uh, of him as uh, their supreme ruler and uh, their acceptance of a single man being king. And so what you see is, is that in verse 20, uh, God begins to find Samuel. And this is how he finds him. So I'm going to start with verse 19. Uh, says, but you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your uh, adversaries and your tribulations. And you have said to him, no, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. I want you to watch what happens in verse 20. And when Samuel had calls all tribes of Israel, everybody say tribes. So he calls the tribes of Israel to come near. The tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he calls the tribe of Benjamin to come near, their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Uh, therefore, they inquired of the Lord further, uh, has a man uh, come here yet? Now, that bottom portion is a completely uh, different subject. But I really want to dive off of uh, that first uh, section of verse 20 and 21. Uh, and it, this will all come together. Uh, one preacher said, you know, it, it's looking like scrambled eggs, but hopefully I can make an omelet out of it in here in a little bit. So uh, we should try to do that. Uh, we're going to pray. We're going to pray, and then we'll move forward. Um, I just want you to set your Bibles down if that's okay. And uh, uh, if you're standing next to family, if that's all right, uh, why don't you just grab their hand? And uh, I want us to pray together. I just want you to connect with the Lord. If you're not staying next to family, but you feel comfortable uh, grabbing the hand of a friend or someone close to you, why don't you do that as well? Uh, let us just connect with the Holy Ghost. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you, God, for your power. I thank you for your presence, God. I thank you, God, that this is your church, God. God, it's your body. It's your people, God. It's your city. It's your harvest field. It's your laborers, oh God. I pray, God, that you would have your way, God. I, I submit myself to your word, to your will, to your presence. Say whatever you want to say the way you want to say it, God. God, there's no performance we could present to you, God, that could sway you or move you, but just a hungry heart, God, that we're presenting before you. I pray, God, tonight that you would speak to your people, God. Let the undercurrent of the Holy Ghost begin to sweep over us, Jesus. God, let it move everything, God, that's not like you. 
I pray your presence would have your way, God, in every marriage, every family, every heart, and every mind, oh God. God, we want more of you tonight, Jesus. We want more of you tonight, Jesus. We're hungry for your presence, oh God. We're hungry for your spirit, oh God. We're asking God that you would have your way, God. We're praying, God, that you would remove weariness, God. I pray, God, that every weary body, every weary mind, God, every fatigued marriage, oh God. God, where the enemy, God, has been battered their minds, their hearts, their souls. Touch them today, God. Touch families today, oh God. Bring rest to the weary, God. Bring strength, God, to the powerless, oh God. God, I'm thanking you for the refreshing of the Holy Ghost that's going to move in this place. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. 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 Kingdom structure. Kingdom structure. Uh, one of my favorite topics to preach on, uh, if you call it preaching, whatever you want to uh, call it, uh, is uh, on the kingdom. Uh, and the reason being is, is because uh, I feel like that should be our premier focus. And that's what Jesus even says of, uh, of his disciples. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness uh, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, I, I kind of uh, delve, I, I dove into uh, a little bit of uh, what the kingdom of God actually is uh, to us. And uh, I won't go too much into that, but suffice it to say that, that God's kingdom is the manifestation of his presence. It's a place where he has uh, dominance, where he's been given full reign and full authority to function uh, uh, in, his, uh, in the entirety of his nature, in the entirety of his nature. And so uh, that place is the kingdom of God. Now, uh, before we kind of go any further, I need to establish that uh, every kingdom has rules and principles in which it abides by. Amen. There's there's structure to every kingdom. There's structure to every kingdom. And uh, it, it is it is an insult for us to enter a kingdom and then try to change how it works. Amen. You, you, you just can't do that. <laughs> you, you know, you can't be invited into my house and then try to rearrange the furniture. Amen. First off, my wife would have an issue with that. Amen. And then I would have an issue with that. It's just, it's just, it's just not going to go well. And so uh, it, it would, it would, it would be, it would be good for us to understand how the kingdom is actually structured. How the kingdom is actually structured. Uh, one of the greatest things uh, that God ever says within the confines of the scripture is when He begins to relate the reality of how He works through people. And uh, it's not just seen in the Old Testament, but it's also seen in the New Testament. And uh, Jesus reflects this when he's arguing uh, with uh, the Pharisees. And in arguing with the Pharisees, he begins to tell them, listen, don't you know that I am the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Amen. And he uses this as a launching pad to help them understand that uh, he didn't say I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I am the God of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what he was attempting to relay is that Abraham was still in existence, but before Abraham, I was. And so I, I, I still am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, now this is profound because you can miss a lot there. Amen. You can miss the reality that God actually works with generations. Amen. God is a generational God. Amen. He does not skip uh, the process of, of, of the family structure. Amen. When he presents this, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He presents a few things there. One, he presents three generations. Uh, he presents the first patriarch, which is Abraham, and then he moves on to being the God of Isaac, and then the God of Jacob. The second thing that's presented there is that there is family structure that God actually functions in, that God is actually the God of families. You guys with me? Amen. That God is the God of families. Now, uh, what's so important for this is that you can, you can miss the confines in which the scripture is actually released. And uh, I'm sure I've touched on this before, but uh, just, just, just oblige me to come here again. Uh, that, that the scripture is actually presented within the reality of families. Uh, 
When God begins to speak to, uh, through the prophet Moses uh, and begins to dictate to him uh, the chronicles of history and begins to outline the law, where you pick up is, is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you could throw that on the board for me, all of you guys can quote this. Uh, this is what we call the Shema. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is the focal point of, uh, of, of, of Old Testament doctrine and really uh, the foundation of uh, the New Testament church. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. And we all know it. It says Hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Next verse for me please. Scripture continues and then it begins to say, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, with all thine might. Amen. You can stop right there. Uh, what you have to see is, is this is first a personal experience. Amen. This is first a personal experience. But I want you to see what happens after the personal experience. If you can continue. Next verse, 6, verse 6 for me, please. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. It's still personal. 6, verse 7 for me, please. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Generational. So God allows the confines of his words to first be personal and then to be expounded into a generational sphere. Amen. And a lot of times as the church, we can miss out on the generational link that allows the kingdom of God to be expanded. Because God never did one thing through just one person. I know we like to say that a lot. But God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That dictates to you that there are foundations to how God moves. And so that God cannot just work with Paul, he also needs a Timothy. That God just won't just do it through Elijah, he needs a life. That God won't just walk through Jesus, but he'll do it through his 12 apostles. And the missing link that we will find is that if we don't connect our family, we are serving a God that is working with us, but does not know our kids. And God forbid, God knows us, but doesn't know our family. Amen, amen, amen. I, 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 I want you to realize that the enemy understands this. The enemy understands that 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 how 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 important this is how how important this is can you just do me a favor if you help out with sunday school in any way shape or form i just need you to stand for me if you help out with sunday school any way shape or form can we give these people a hand <laughs> sunday school amen sunday school everybody say sunday school everybody say sunday school you could be seated for me. Uh, if you're a parent or a grandparent in the room, can you stand for me, please? Amen. Can I acknowledge the reality that this is Monday through Saturday school right here? And the dis... I want you to hear me. The disconnect here is that we're trying to get Sunday school to reinforce what Monday through Saturday did not establish. I love you guys. <laughs> You can be seated. Uh, parents, I, I, want to, I want to help you understand the role that you play in this. That, that, that for some reason in church, uh, we highlight specific things. Uh, we highlight the preacher. Uh, we highlight musicians. Uh, we highlight singers. Uh, now in a day and age of, of, te of technology, uh, we highlight those who function on a creative level. We highlight those who function on an on an administrative level. But can I tell you that those aren't the premier positions within the body of Christ? That's not foundational. I'm so thankful for every department leader in this place, every person who's running a department. I, I believe in it. I believe in structure. Uh, I'm supposed to be here trying to help administrate some stuff. Uh, I don't know how good of a job I'm doing, but I'm trying. Amen. And so I, I believe in administration. I, I think it's all good and well. Uh, but we have neglected uh, uh, expounding the value of of the family within the church. Amen. The preacher has its place of prominence. The musician has its place of prominence. But we forget that one of the premier positions within the body of Christ uh, is to be part of the family. Kingdom structure. Are you guys with me today? 
You guys with me today? Amen. We, 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 we need to come back to understanding that God has a structure in which he works. How, how we usually line this up is we have what we call priorities. Amen. And uh, if I ask you your priorities, uh, you list them out to me in, in priority one and priority two and priority three and priority four. Uh, that's that's kind of how we orchestrate our priorities. And I, I, I think that's uh, contrary to how God works this out. Amen. I think it's contrary to how God works this out because I do not believe that that is how God orchestrates or wants us to prioritize things. If if I were to give you a, a, a visual to hold on to, it would almost work like a solar system. Amen. And so you would have the nucleus. Amen. And outside that nucleus, there would be another another sphere that would be rotating outside that nucleus. And outside of that would be another sphere that would rotate outside that nucleus. Can I tell you how it is? Uh, the sphere of uh, the sphere of the church is very simple. Uh, if you're going to have a healthy church, you need a healthy family. Amen. That's just that's just how it works. Amen. Uh, 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 that that that's why that's why your Sunday school teacher can't spend more time teaching your kids about the Bible than you do. Amen. Amen. Man, you guys are quiet on me. Amen. Praise God. You, uh, if you don't know the last time that you engaged them in a corporate prayer, Marcus, why are you making such a big deal about this? Because because I, I I've been to public school in this county. Amen. And, and, and showing up for one hour back there isn't going to do what we should be doing seven day a week with our family. You cannot have a healthy church with dysfunctional families. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm out there. I might as well. I've, I done swallowed cap. I'm not going to choke on the tail. Amen. Amen. You, you, you cannot have a healthy church with dysfunctional families. What you have is performance. You do not have health. Amen. And we are living in a culture that highlights presentation over health. It looks healthy, but it ain't healthy. Hey, well, anyways. <laughs> and so what we have to realize is, is that God has an order in which he does things. Amen. And if you're going to have a healthy church, what you first need is you need a healthy family. Amen. But if you're going to have a healthy family, you need healthy members of that family. And so if you're going to have a healthy member, you need a healthy mind. That's why Paul always challenged the mind. Uh, uh, there are times as Pentecostals, I know I'm moving slow. Is this okay? Okay. There, there are times as Pentecostals that we can fall under the trap that God is always moving in, 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 the, uh, in, in the irrational or the illogical or the unexplainable. And there are moments when that happens. But can I tell you that God first starts by taking what we understand to bring us to what we don't understand. That is what a parable is. A parable is trying to take you from an earthly concept to, to help you understand a heavenly meaning. And we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough of parabolical moves of God. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, is moves that, 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 that take us from where we are to bring us to a place where we cannot explain. But, but there's something that helps challenge the mind. And that's why Paul said, listen, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to think differently. Can I tell you uh, the biggest misconception about holiness in the apostolic? movement is that we relegate it to what is external that is not transformation that is conformity we are trying to get people to conform to holiness not transform into holiness I'm, I'm, I'm here. Hey, I love you. Amen. Amen we, 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 we do this thing where people do stuff they don't even know why they're doing it that's not transformation that's conformity and when you're conformed to something, it happens on the outside. It deals with pressure. That word that Paul uses is one that deals with pressure, one that's pushing up against you. And that's how Pentecostals live from one day to the next. They just live by pressure, Pastor. We're pressured into doing right. Well, I didn't pray. I'm pressured. I, I didn't fast. I'm pressured. I, I'm not living right. I'm pressured. And all of a sudden, we wonder why we become legalistic and can't accept grace. Pressure after pressure after pressure after pressure. And now we start, we start comparing ourselves among ourselves. Well, oh, praise God. Hey, 
Amen, 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 amen. I, I, I'm wearing what I'm supposed to be wearing, but 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 why is her stuff so tight and my stuff is loose? And, and why does she say that? And, and how come he does this? And, and you have to justify your holiness because the comparison is not internal. It's external. And Paul says, if you're ever going to get it right, you better make sure that you're not conformed into a religious place, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You better make sure that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Clap your hands unto the Lord if you believe that. Uh, Lift your voice and talk to the Lord and tell him, God, uh, transform my mind. Transform my mind. Amen. 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 Say amen. Amen. This is why it's so important that our minds are transformed. It has to be changed. This is why I can't preach this enough. I, 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 I struggle with the reality that we understand apostolic action and do not understand apostolic attitude. You can look apostolic. You can talk apostolic. You can sound apostolic. But if it did not happen on the inside, you're not apostolic. You are a white and sepulcher full of dead men's bones if you can't pray if you can't fast if you can't connect with the holy ghost <laughs> this is why our minds have to be right this is why you got to be careful what you put in this is why this is why the elders preached holiness we always say be ye holy as I am holy. Do you know what that's saying? It's not just saying take on the concept of my holiness. I need you to take on the nature of my holiness. Do you realize how holy God is? You ever heard the angels cry something? Pastor, what do they cry? They cry holy, holy. Consider that. That is a state of progression. Anyone would tell you that when something is repeated within the Greek language, it's done for emphasis. It's trying to state the fact that, that it's moving from one state to the next state to the next state. We have Christians that only know how to live at a base level. And holiness is progressive. If you're not moving towards it, you're not holy. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. Amen. Be holy as I am holy. Transformation starts with the mind. Can't, I, I'm not going to preach in some abstract place. You know, it's the little fox that spoil the vineyards, and we forget about that. Amen. It, it, it's not what we do on Sunday. Uh, what are you putting in your mind? Because whatever you put in your mind is going to dictate how far you can go in God. Amen. Uh, you can't tell me that you're listening to a whole bunch of stuff. Amen. That you're that you're watching a whole bunch of stuff. Amen. That you're that you're going a whole bunch of places. I know this is uncomfortable preaching, but this is transformative preaching. Paul said you need to make sure that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to renew it. You need to bring life back into it. You can't let it just stay dead. You can't. The only thing that brings life is the word. Thy word is life. Thy word is what quickens. Your word is, is a two-edged sword dividing between the soul and the spirit. It's his word. And if you're not putting your his word in your mind, you're not renewing your mind. Amen. And so you have the mind. The mind needs to be checked. You've got to gird up the loins of your mind. Amen. There's just certain thoughts you just can't let uh, linger in your mind. Amen. You, you better make sure your mind stays right. Uh, you better make sure your mind stays right. Amen. We, we, we don't have a pornography problem in America. Amen. Uh, we don't have a lust problem in America. Uh, uh, we we have a we have a we have a, we have a lack of self control in America. The American church is suffering from Western decadency because we no longer know how to say no. We don't know how to make the mental decision of just saying no, no, I can't do that. No, that's not where I'm going. No, that's not who I am. No, that's not who. And besides saying no, we don't know how to say yes. We walk into church and don't know how to say yes to prayer, yes to worship, yes to the word, yes to commitment, yes to, it all starts in the mind. It needs to be self-control 
in mind. And can I, can I talk to you parents uh, as young as you possibly can? I am I'm baffled by the stuff that happens out in the world. I mean, I, I mean, it blows my mind. Uh, and if you're not careful, you will slowly drift. That's the issue with comparison. You can drift and not even know it. Because if I'm comparing myself to you or you, if you take, if, we're, if there's just three steps in between us, you can keep on stepping and I'm stepping with you, but the distance stays the same. And all of a sudden, I'm all the way out there. But the word is what stays anchored. Amen. I'll move on. I'll move on. Amen. Transformed by the room. It's the mind. The mind is the starting place. That's why the first place we start with Christians is not with the unexplainable. God never started with anyone there. You can't point to one person. He's dealing with, he's dealing with uh, Saul. And, and, and he begins to cry out to Saul. Saul, Saul. You know what? You know what? How Paul responds or how Saul responds? Same person. He says, Lord, who art thou? That is a question. A question is answered with the mind. The mind has to be targeted every day. Every day. You got to get in this word every day. Amen. We have to get into prayer every day. Amen. Sunday cannot make up for every day. Amen, amen. Starts with the mind. The second level I already discussed is it's, it's the member of the family. Amen. And then it's the family and then it's the church. I, uh, the scripture that I started off with is this is this. I've never seen this before until a few weeks ago because I was asking the Lord. I said, God, God, what is your structure? Amen. Because what you have to realize is that is that God's spirit is not going to inhabit just any structure. Uh, he's not going to put new wine into old wineskin because it just won't contain it. And so I want to know, God, God, what's your structure? How did you do things? And what you realize is that God had a church structure. God had a church structure. When God was trying to find people, when God was trying to work with people, I want you to realize how he did it. Second Samuel, sorry, first Samuel chapter 10. I'm going to start with the scriptures we've read. And I want you to see something that I never saw before. Maybe you saw it. But first Samuel chapter chapter 10 starts off like this and it says and when samuel had caused all of the tribes to come near the tribe of benjamin was chosen and then after he chose the tribe of benjamin it says the families uh, uh then he called them by families and the family of matri was chosen and then it says saul the son of kish was chosen this is how god worked in the old testament this was the Old Testament structure. You ever imagine, how, Pastor, how did God move millions of people out of Egypt into the promised land? You ever ask yourself that? I mean, we struggle with structures that just fit a few hundred. They started off with a few million. And then Moses was trying to counsel all of them. I'm shocked the man lived three days. Could you imagine? I mean, I, I would have been one of those knuckleheads, but there were just a lot of knuckleheads. I mean, three days after seeing the water split, they're just, oh, my goodness, we should have just died in Egypt. And if I was God, I would have looked down and said, well, you probably should have. I mean, you're probably right. I mean, with this type of attitude, I don't know what to tell you. Amen. But, 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 this, but they, they had millions of people that they're moving all at once. And I wonder, God, how did you work that when they would go to war? This was the format that they used, right? They didn't have departments, now, I, I don't want you to think that I'm belittling departments. That's not what I'm saying. But I need you to understand that, 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 that departments, they're, they're auxiliaries. We, we, we augment them in. They're not foundational. Amen. Because you can't have a department in an underground church. That's just the truth. I know we enjoy a lot of liberties as Americans, but we might not always have that. However you feel about that. Amen. That's just the reality. And beyond that, even, even if we have it, there's millions of people across the world that don't have it. So God doesn't build off departments. You know how God built? God built off of families. And so every single time he wanted to find someone, when he wanted to find sin in the camp, he told Moses, he said, Moses, there's sin in the camp. And here's what's so crazy. The individual affected the whole nation. One person's sin. One. One person's sin affected the whole nation. Well, it's just, it's just my life. You can't tell me how to live it. It's, it's your life, but it's his kingdom. And you affect the kingdom with what you do. Man, 
development. I know, I know in America we preach independence, independence. In kingdom we are interdependent. I'm dependent on you and you're dependent on me. Amen. And so when God wanted to find sin, how did they do it? He did it in the same manner. He brought the people of Israel together. And then he called out tribes. After he called out tribes, he called out families. This would be like everybody with the same last name. And then he called out households. Do you know that this is actually how they gathered manna? They did it by household. He said, watch this. And what's, here's what's so crazy. I don't understand this, but I'm pretty sure I, I have this right. Here's what's so crazy. When God tells him to do it, he speaks in a singular form, but on behalf of a plural group. He says, one person, go out and get what's necessary for your household. So the man was supposed to get manna for the household. Amen. It's not pastor's responsibility to make sure that our families are spiritually fed. Can I just be honest? Every household had to make sure you had enough manna for your house. Isn't it crazy, pastor? Listen, and here's what's crazy. Manna came from the same place. It was just your responsibility to go get it. So the preacher goes behind the pulpit. He preaches, and there's a word that goes out. But you look out and some families are blessed and others aren't. Why? Because it's your responsibility to go get enough change and go get enough transformation for your family. You have to do it for your household. It's not a department thing. It's not the youth jobs. It's not Sunday school job to make sure that our kids are being fed. It is our responsibility. Amen. 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 Here's here's how here's how God will do it. He would he would call the tribes. And here's what's so crazy. I could be wrong on this, but just let me step out and try to, you know, if I'm wrong, I'll come back and tell you I'm wrong. But 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 I believe the New Testament parallel to this are actually churches. You look at you look at the church of uh, Ephesus. You had a large network. Uh, Some people number it up to 50,000 people. Timothy was in his 20s. Some people say that he could have been as young as 24. I'm 25. Amen. Praise God. I, I don't know what the brother was doing. He was bald. I'm, trust me, he was bald. There's no way he wasn't bald. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But, but no, no offense to anyone who's bald. I mean, it's a great look. You can make it work. I'm just saying. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But, 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 but Timothy, Pastor, Timothy is leading the church in Ephesus, and this is a network. This is the New Testament people of God. And, and he says, I need you to establish bishops. I need you to establish deacons. I need you to establish elders. What was he doing? He was working with a network. And watch you, one of the premier factors of of establishing leadership was not talent. It was character. We are so quick to promote talented people as if God's going to be impressed. Like Lucifer was supposed to shake him or something. Like, wow, look at this man. He's just so gifted. He can sing in four-part harmony all by himself. Uh, He'll switch octave all he needs to. He don't even need a band. He's up there. The brother is a bad brother. And God's looking at you. I, I made the talent. Amen. He looked at character. And if you looked at how they structured it, what it basically would work, it's basically working on what we're doing. I mean, we got what we call a campus. Trying to reach Southwest Volusia County. We got what we call a campus. Amen. Got a campus in Deltona, got a campus in the land. Amen. But the health of every single church or campus or every single tribe is dictated by families. I know you guys have stood at few points, but I really want to emphasize the responsibility. If you are a couple in this place, if you're a married couple, can you stand, please? You are foundational. You're foundational. If you don't pray, this church can't be spiritual. If you don't fast, this church can't can't be spiritual if you don't go get the word for your household this church can't be spiritual the health of the church was dictated by the family well preacher i don't hold a position i see i'm looking at faces i mean some of you guys are incredible people you guys serve on a consistent basis preacher i just hold the door i just i just smile at people you don't get it you're not just doing that it's what you do when you're not here that makes you foundational 
What you don't realize, you might just be Abraham, but out of you will come Joseph and Jacob and Judah and David. And so you're birthing greatness if you'll just remain foundational. Amen, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. We're talking about kingdom structure. Just give me a few moments. Some of you, some of you are here and and uh, your, your spouses isn't here. It doesn't matter. You, you're you still foundational. You, if you're representing a family, even if all your family's not here, you're still foundational. And you better make sure that you're someone worth building on. Because we can only build on you. Can I tell you that a lot of the concerts that we get, they're not New Testament. I know this is real different. Y'all used to be yelling and screaming. I'm doing a little bit of that. Just stay with me. We're so used to, 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 to church growth and 21st century church culture and how 21st century church works is, is that the pulpit influences and the pew instructs. So the pew dictates what we're going to preach about, what standards we're going to have, how we're going to feel about holiness, if we'll talk about certain things. The pew does the instructing, but the pulpit does the influence. We call these uh, personality preachers. They could draw a crowd because they just got the right personality. And so they influence you. You don't know anybody else in the church, but you can name all these personality preachers because they're doing the influencing. And the pew's doing the instructing. Can I tell you that is contrary to New Testament. New Testament was completely reversed. The pulpit did the instructing. The pew did the influencing. They might never know who Peter or Paul was. But they instructed the pew to influence the society. And the thing is, if you build off a personality, you create an idol. But if you will build off a principle, you'll establish the kingdom. Amen. Amen. I'm only going to go a few minutes longer, and then I'm done. But I feel like the Lord is challenging us. I mean, we, we saw some stuff, we saw some stuff happen during COVID and, 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 and we can suffer from spiritual amnesia. So, I mean, we easily, I mean, praise him. Some of y'all this time last year, y'all, y'all thought the rapture was going to happen tomorrow. Some of y'all this time of year, y'all can't even spell rapture. <laughs> just, I mean, <laughs> we're just, we're just kind of out there. Amen. We just suffer from spiritual amnesia. But, but pastor, can I tell you that when the church was persecuted, they grew. And was God trying to wake us up that when he shut our buildings down, that if we did not increase, it's because our structure was wrong? Because kingdom structure works best when it's put in darkness. Kingdom structure works because you can silence a personality, but how do you silence the pews? I'm challenging this church. I'm challenging this church. I, I believe God is bringing us into apostolic order, into apostolic structure. But what needs to happen is we need to realize our role in the body because we have a wrong mindset. I, I, I've been here the, the, the past few months, been the greatest few months. I, I, I enjoy this more than evangelizing. I really do. I generally, my, my wife will tell you, I, I don't really talk about evangelizing like, you know, like, I enjoy it. I don't, I don't mind it. I, I, I'm blessed to preach out of different churches, but I genuinely enjoy just, just helping here. I genuinely enjoy helping here. And I feel like the two things that I'm really trying to do is, is help with the church building, right? The church building, that's like departments, that's like systems, and trying to get things figured out. But, 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 but really, that's only so we can get start working on the church body. Because we, we're not always going to have the building. I, I could be wrong. I'm not saying God told me this. This is just from what I can see. I do not think, first of all, we, don't, we prove we can't, we can't do well when, when uh, God's blessing us. That's just the truth. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to leave that there. Amen. 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 <laughs> yeah, I will, let's just keep on going. Amen. God, I mean, God, God will bless us. <laughs> God will bless us with the right, with the right quote-unquote political party as if God's political, right? God will bless us with the, God will bless us with the right political party. We'll have the right people. <laughs> Amen. And we don't know how to act. Amen. I, so I, I personally, I personally, I, 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 I'm of the persuasion that when God is going to wrap this thing up, we're not going to have all of this. I just don't think we will. I don't think we will. First off, I think this is just way too convenient yeah. because this no longer beca- becomes a building. It becomes a fort. We hide in here. We hide in here. Amen. Because, because when we're out there, if we don't pray, people know it. But when we're in here, I can kind of just, you know, sister so-and-so's praying, I could kind of kind of tether myself to 
Just be careful doing that because you can't do that when you get up there. But anyways, uh, working on the church body. And, and when you're working with the church body, uh, uh, when you're working with the church building, the highlights is departments. And again, there's nothing, I want you to hear me. There's nothing wrong with departments. I love every department leader. Your role is critical. But I have to address this because we will not always have this. You, you, you write this down. You mark my words. Tell, tell the preachers in Canada. Tell the underground church in China. We're, we're not always going to have this. And so with the church building, what we highlight is, is different leadership positions, and that's great. We need to, and I think we ought to do that with excellence, do our best with it. But when you're working with the church body, what's highlighted is the family. And we need to come back that the health of the family is reflecting the health of the church. Because can I tell you, the pulpit is healthy, but there's some of us, if we were to be honest, our families are not healthy. And if we go a little bit beyond that, our minds are not healthy. Us as individual members are not healthy. And I want to work this thing backwards, that we would make sure the importance of these things. I want to talk to parents. I want to talk to people. You are a leader. When we talk about leadership, we talk about ministry, we talk about church position, you hold one of the most important church positions that anyone could ever give you. If you're a grandparent in this place, I need you to hear me. You are a leader. You are influencing the convictions of the next generation of this church. You influence whether they believe in holiness. You influence how they see the oneness of God. You influence how they walk in prayer and fasting. I, you might never preach behind the pulpit or stand back there in Sunday school, but if you can crack open a Bible study or teach them search for truth or just spend a few moments praying for them, you are influenced during their internal state, and that matters. Hey Amen. I want us all to stand. I'm asking every parent, every grandparent, every every husband, every spouse, if you can come forward, if you're, if, you're, if you're just part of a family, if you're a child in that family, if you're part of a family, if you're part of a family unit, even if your family's not here, if it's just you, you're representing a family, I'm asking you to come forward. I want you to come down as a unit. I want you to come down as a unit. Preacher, I don't, I don't, I don't do a lot. I just, you know, I just help out with this or I just help out with that. I don't do anything great. You're missing the point. You're foundational. God is building on you. God is building on you. And make sure that you are strong enough to be built on, that you're not going to sway. I'm challenging families in this place. The spiritual temperature of this church is not dictated by our church service. It's dictated by our home lives. What we do at home, and this type of preaching, I know it's not comfortable, but it's necessary because this is when we get the things that we need to get right. When's the last time you prayed together as a family? I know I tackle this every single time I come behind the pulpit, but you get what you preach. And if we need healthy families, I'm going to preach it over and over. And if we need healthy minds, I'm going to preach it over and over. Because my challenge is to you that we make sure that we can be built upon. Amen. I'm going to challenge us to do a few things. I'm going to challenge us to do a few things. Here's the reality. Uh, for some of us, we, you know, we, we wouldn't miss a doctor's appointment with our kid. And I know I'm not a parent, and I, I hope you guys don't feel like I'm overstepping my bounds. But I want to help you. I want to help you. For some of us, we would never miss a doctor appointment for our spouse. We wouldn't miss a doctor appointment for ourselves. But why do we so casually miss time spent in prayer? When's the last time we intentionally scheduled time to pray together as a family? You won't always have corporate prayer. Well, preacher, they're only three, four, five years old. That time, they need to see you investing into them. The greatest person, well, we always talk about discipling. The greatest person you can disciple. It's not Sunday school's responsibility. It's Monday through Saturday. We're going to pray here, and I, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to allow God to challenge your mind. Allow God to challenge your thinking. Allow God to rearrange your priorities. When's the last time, God, that we set aside time to pray? We make time to watch movies as a family. We make time for entertainment as a family. But our spiritual lives matter. 
When's the last time we made time for spiritual things together as a family? Amen. If you can just bow your heads and close your eyes. And we're going to pray. I want you just to allow the Lord just to convict your heart, to convict your mind. Some of you, the most spiritual thing you can do before you leave this altar is pick up a Bible plan with your family. I don't care if it's two chapters a day, three chapters a week, start somewhere. Some of the things, the most spiritual thing you can do is not a war in tongues all by yourself, but forget just to spend a few moments praying with your kid. I just want you to pray. I'm talking to spouses. I'm talking to spouses. If we're not praying together, if, if the family is built on the marriage, if we're not praying together, if we're not spending time together, I'm talking, so there's some young kids in this place. Your family's not even in church. They're, you're the strongest one in your family. Can I tell you, can, can you, don't, don't repeat the habits of the past. You don't have to be like your parents. You can start a new legacy. You can do something different. You can be a spiritual home. You don't have to be like mom and dad. I don't care if that's what they did. I'm talking to couples. You don't remember the last time you prayed together. That's all right. Forget about that. I'm talking about right now. What can we do now to make sure that God can build upon us? That God can build upon us. That's it. All across the building. Just just pray with me for a few moments. Uh, I'm talking to people that you're here. You're just an individual. There's no one else in your family. But you don't realize that God's using you. Uh, God's working through you. Uh, God's touching you. Uh, Come on, I want you to pray. Ask the Lord God, convict my heart, convict my mind. I'm talking to some dads in this place. God's calling you back to a place of spiritual warfare where you would go out and bring manna back into the house, where you would go back and bring the word back into the house. So that you would make sure that there's nothing in the house that doesn't need to be there. I'm talking to spouses. I know you're struggling. I know you're fighting. But if you would crack the word open again, if you would bend your knees again in prayer, if you would say, hey, we're going to be a house that serves the Lord. As for me and my house, as for me and my house. I know you don't have kids yet, but what you do now affects what you'll do when they're here. I'm talking to young people. You need to get these things right now. Get your mind right now. Get wholeness right now. Because you can only build on what you present. That's it. Come on. I want you to pray. Come on, spouse. You need to let, I'm talking to wives right now. You need to let go of the bitterness and the resentment that you have towards your husband that's limiting him from leading spiritually. I know he hasn't been perfect. I know he didn't get it all right, but we're making a change. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting with each other. We're fighting for each other. We're fighting for the kingdom. There's couples you need to let go of that resentment you have towards one another. I feel it so strong in the Holy Ghost. You need to let go of that resentment and you need to allow the Holy Ghost to bring unity back to where there needs to be it. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, man of God, I need you to shake off the condemnation. I need you to shake off the timidity. I need you to shake off the fear. Come on, I'm talking to families. I know you guys haven't been perfect. I know there's been issues. I know there's bitterness. I know there's struggles. But we need to forgive each other and remember that God is building on us, that God is depending on us that God is trying to work through us we don't have to be perfect to be united (laughs) 
I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you in the Holy Ghost. Stop being a critic and start helping. Stop criticizing what they're not doing, how they're not leading, what they didn't do, why they're doing it wrong. And start leading, start encouraging, start loving one again. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I want you to pray over your homes right now, your physical homes. I just want you to pray towards your physical homes. I want you to stretch your hands, and I want you to pray over your homes. I want you to tell God, God, my house is going to be a house of prayer. My home is going to be a place of unity. Our home is going to be a place of consecration. Our home is going to be a place of worship, oh God. God, we're going to remove the idols that we set up in there. God, the entertainment that we set up in there, God. God, we're going to remove the idols. The tree, God, the self worship, God, the self indulgence, oh God. God, our homes are going to be places of holiness. Our homes are going to be places of purity, oh God. I need some parents to make up in their mind when you get back home. You're going to anoint the doors of those young men, those young women that aren't here. I'm talking to parents. Your kids are backslidden. They don't pray anymore. They don't fast anymore. You ought to make up in your mind. When I get home, I'm going to anoint those doors. I'm going to anoint those walls. My family will serve the Lord. Lord, my house will serve the Lord. I know you've been fighting. I know you've been pushing, but don't stop yet. God still wants to save our families. God still wants to work through our families. <laughs>